What's up? It is 3 p.m. on a Sunday afternoon. Thanks for tuning in to Cannabis Legalization News, where we explain marijuana laws so you can change them. Today, we are joined by Josh Kincaid as a special guest host. Hey, Josh and Tom. How, are you? How y'all doing? Happy Sunday. Happy Memorial Day as well. Oh, yeah. Yep. Anything planned? Uh, I've already been to at least one cookout, so I've covered my bases. Josh, how, how's the cookout situation in Washington State? Uh, it's a little overcast, but um, you know the cookout is is about to start, so kicking it off with you guys first. <laughs> well, you know, thanks so much for joining us. If you guys haven't checked out Josh's uh, YouTube channel, you should. It's Talking Hedge. It is the Cannabis Business Podcast. How long have you been doing that? This is the third season, so got about seven hundred and seventy-five uh, unique videos out there now. That's awesome. Yeah, doing this podcast has really allowed us to uh, just accumulate videos. I mean, like we've been able to accumulate so many videos and, and gain members and it's the, the end of the month show. So we're going to do a focus on cannabis legalization news at a federal level. And then we look at uh, our status of our channel and then say, okay, well, how much are we giving away this month? Because we give 50% of our revenue away. Uh, our channel doesn't do that much revenue because despite having 27,000 subscribers, uh, we're in cannabis. So anything that we do very often is flagged. It's going to be 268 bucks. So we'll cut that in half and donate it to Freedom Grow Forever. Uh, Freedom Grow Forever, of course, uh, puts money on cannabis prisoners commissary. And so we try to help them out through the channel. Uh, and of course, you know, um, thanks for joining us. We're going to be giving away a shirt on the name that strain. So, uh, like, share, subscribe, all that stuff. Awesome. Yeah, man. So federal news, the big thing that ended up the uh, the week that was the week before Memorial Day. Uh, finally, Naylor beats Schumer uh, in the race to file something at the federal level. So the Moore Act has been uh, filed once again, and it would already passed last time. It'll probably pass this time, but they made some changes to it. They did. And uh, so now they, they've made changes to um, facilitate the expungement of low-level federal marijuana convictions. I wonder how many low-level federal marijuana convictions there are. But then also there's, because like the reason why I mentioned that is, uh, uh, Josh, do you know who does the principal law enforcement in the uh, United States? Principal law enforcement? Yeah, the federal or the state governor? Which one is usually more of the police? Uh, you got me, man. Police is uh, it's a local thing. And so very often you're going to be uh, arrested by local cops or you're going to be arrested by your state cops. Very rarely are you going to be arrested by like the FBI or the DEA, some federal federales, those types of people. They, they don't necessarily do that much. And especially with weed now, because uh, Biden's six trillion dollar budget has uh, proposed to defund anything that is state law compliant, which would be great. But the MORE Act has uh, some more things, you know, um, uh, different changes this time. It's going to allow veterans to obtain medical cannabis recommendations from their VA doctors. Think about that. That's pretty dope. That We're kind of a sanctuary huge. state now in Washington where you can kind of get away with everything, but at the same time, it's not available. So, I mean, if they can make it actually available for veterans, that's one thing. But at least they're not going to be arrested for it anymore in Washington. Like, regardless, we've decriminalized all drugs, just like Colorado. So, I mean, we're, we're good on with that regards. But isn't this going to be like the fifth time that they're going to be voting on the House? Um, is there a reason behind that? Is like a, it's a new Congress or something? So they have that's to like it. start over. That's it. That's literally it. And so Congress is every two years. And because it's every two years, there's just a slim major minority of bills that actually get out of committee and get voted on. And very often they take years. And so that's one of these things that they're doing now is they have to pass it again. They passed it out of the House last uh, uh, Congress, but that Congress is gone. They have to reconvene it. And then uh, the Senate never brought it up. So now they're going to pass it again, and they've added a lot more social equity types of policies into it. I'll have to do a video where I go through the text, but I still haven't been able to find the actual bill that they filed. I realized it was just filed on Friday. Uh, maybe they haven't published it yet because they're like, hey, three-day weekend, boss. We can get to this on Tuesday. But who knows? Yeah, they expanded the social equity and, and made it into more, um, you know, into the SBA, Small Business Association. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, when I was in banking, hardly any of those ever passed. So I'm not sure it's actually going to impact anybody if it has to go through all that bureaucracy. 
there needs to be something set out specifically for those impacted by the war on drugs rather than allow the current inefficient government model of an SBA to give out these licenses. It's never going to happen. Yeah, it's much more difficult because a lot of the times the licenses are done at the state level. I mean, that's exclusively how they are now with federal prohibition. But uh, one thing that this, the feds can really do is set immigration policy because immigration is a nationwide uh, policy. You don't want each individual state having its own immigration policy. It wouldn't be very effective. And so one of the things that will be changed in the new Moore Act is the uh, the removing the threat of deportation for immigrants accused of minor marijuana infractions or who are gainfully employed in the state legal cannabis industry. And I get a lot of uh, people that call and they aren't from America. They might be on a particular type of visa. And sometimes I'm like, well, you really want to be careful on that. Now with the uh, the next budget year, if they change that from being uh, medical marijuana to all marijuana, the state compliant is prohibited from Department of Justice interference. Great. Now maybe you can actually not necessarily risk being deported, but INS isn't DOJ, so you still would. It, it becomes difficult, like, you know, if you want to actually try to invest in cannabis and you also want to have a visa. Mm -hmm. Now, is that just a blanket kind of statement that they're not going to use any federal funds including immigration or you know um no it's very often been directed expressly at the department of justice and so the appropriations and the power of the purse the legislature has uh, pursuant to article one of the constitution uh, they are allowed to create and pass the budgets and uh oh nice i'm a way to cabo did we legalize it yet yes miggy <laughs> we did it bro it's party time in cabo <laughs> right. But um, so the legislature has the ability to set how much money will be spent and they work with in conjunction with the administration to set the budget. There's a uh, budget reconciliation. And then sometimes the government is shut down. That happened uh, most recently, I want to say, in the 2018 Farm Bill where Trump signed that into law. That was to avoid a government shutdown in like 2018 into 2019. Uh, and so by around the time the fiscal cliff starts, that's September 30th. That's when the budget year for the feds end. And then you get continuing resolutions until they approve a budget. Uh, and so they say, all right, no money, no appropriation for money at all to the Department of Justice to enforce uh, a state's to enforce the federal marijuana laws in a state, you know, if it's a compliant operator. All right. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Fair enough. And uh, we have some good news out of Missouri. The Missouri legislature has passed a bill protecting the gun rights of legal marijuana patients. That's the M.O. Greenway. And we're going to have Dan Veets on the show to discuss this. So let's bring on Dan Veets. Dan, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. So can you tell us what happened with this uh, new development in Missouri for gun rights and cannabis? Well, Missouri legislature is extremely concerned about gun rights, you know, and almost every year they consider or pass legislation, which is intended to enhance uh, the right to uh, the right to keep and bear arms, which is, of course, part of our state constitution's Bill of Rights, just as it's part of the federal Bill of Rights. The the bill that the legislature passed makes no explicit reference to medical marijuana, uh, but it does say uh, it does say that laws, <clears throat> rules, orders, or other actions that collect data, restrict, or prohibit manufacture, ownership, and use of firearms, accessories, ammunition, etc., cetera, are, uh, exceed the powers granted to the federal government. So our legislature has declared that any such rules exceed the power granted to the federal government. What, what really, if it has teeth, what the, the teeth in this bill is the fact that it declares that if any entity or person um, assists any federal agency in enforcing uh, federal gun laws in Missouri, that they're going to be liable to the injured party for uh, $50,000 per occurrence and injunctive relief and attorney's fees and costs. Um, and so this has been interpreted as, and I think it's correct to interpret that as saying that medical marijuana patients have the right to, uh, to keep and bear arms under uh, Missouri law, and that Missouri law enforcement and Missouri courts are prohibited from doing anything that would infringe that right. But to be uh, accurate, nobody's lost their guns because of medical marijuana. 
either in Missouri or in any other state, so far as I can determine, and I try to follow this issue fairly closely, I heard about an incident in Hawaii where a sheriff seized firearms from some patients and he gave them right back. So hmm. again, I'm not aware of any incident in which any medical marijuana patient has lost his or her firearms solely because of being a medical marijuana user. On the other hand, what is clearly a problem for medical marijuana patients is purchasing more firearms from a federally licensed dealer. Federally licensed firearms dealers are required to uh, inquire of the purchaser about various uh, uh, factors. And one of those is whether the, the purchaser uh, is a legal medical marijuana user under state law. And if, if the answer is in the affirmative, the federally licensed firearms dealer is prohibited from selling a firearm to that person. Now, uh, whether this law is going to change that, frankly, I doubt it. Um, uh, it, it. It may lead to some interesting litigation, but I doubt that it's going to cause federally licensed dealers to begin selling firearms because they don't want to lose their license and the federal government controls whether or not they have that license. It, it does bring up a very interesting collateral issue, however. Last uh, summer, in fact, almost a year ago, the Missouri Supreme Court issued a comment on the interpretation of the rules of, of uh, legal ethics in Missouri. Now, the rules of legal ethics have always said that uh, uh, lawyers aren't supposed to assist anyone in breaking the law. You know, we can assist people after they are accused of breaking the law. We can defend them, but we're not supposed to assist them in committing the law violation. So the comment that the Missouri Supreme Court issued says that if this is not verbatim, but it's very close. Uh, if a lawyer assists a person in an action which may be protected either under Missouri statutory law or Missouri constitutional law, that that attorney is subject to discipline. So that's been widely interpreted as applying to medical marijuana. Lawyers in Missouri who assist either a patient or a business, certainly, uh, in actions which would violate federal law, which means any marijuana possession, um, those attorneys are threatened with, with discipline, even though the Missouri Constitution, uh, when we passed our medical marijuana law here in Missouri, I, I helped to write that. Um, it wasn't my idea, but someone who had good, good sense and foresight put in a provision that says, thou shalt not discipline Missouri attorneys for assisting patients and businesses in medical marijuana. Our state's constitution explicitly says that no licensing body, not the Missouri Bar Association or any licensing body can discipline an attorney for assisting a patient or a business with medical marijuana. And yet the Missouri, the Missouri Supreme Court says in so many words, we don't care what the constitution says the constitution which created us the constitution which yeah. gives us our power yeah our, our whole job isn't to interpret you know we don't care what it says oh no well, well yeah do you it's think amazing. that's uh, uh just evidence of of uh pre-existing prejudice on the part of the missouri Cons uh, supreme court because flora grown in florida came out mm -hmm. last week and then reading that opinion it was just like boy i just don't think that they either don't like marijuana or <laughs> they really like the people who currently have the license to do it and then they're getting paid because i don't i mean i know in mm -hmm. illinois judges have to run and mm -hmm. so i'm assuming in mm -hmm. florida and also in missouri judges have to run that's right yeah that's right it's difficult uh to say what their motivations are but um the point is it could easily be held to apply to this new law as well i mean this is merely a statute the Supreme Court of our state says they're not even bound by constitutional provisions, so they're sure not going to be bound by a mere statute. Now, you know, every attorney in our state, when he or she is uh, sworn in, takes an oath to uphold and protect the United States Constitution and the Missouri Constitution. Doesn't say anything about federal statutes, but our Supreme Court has elevated federal statutes to such a, a high position that. Uh, that if we violate, if we assist anyone in violating a federal statute, we may lose our law license. So, well, so yeah, that I, I'm wondering, 
what's the chances of this catching fire and having a domino effect? Because being in Washington state, the regulatory authority being the liquor and cannabis board has threatened medical marijuana patients by taking away their guns if they sign up for the registry. So I think even though it hasn't happened, it is holding people back from becoming medical patients. Mm -hmm. So what are the chances that this kind of catches fire and has a domino effect to, to, to the point where other states adopt similar uh, policies to kind of protect gun rights for medical patients? Well, hard to say. I certainly can't predict, but uh, uh, one may hope that it would lead to that. Um, one may hope that the Missouri General Assembly would uh, want to protect and defend the Missouri Constitution, not only the provisions that are analogous to the Second Amendment, but also the provisions that have been enacted by a direct vote of the people uh, in, recent, uh, in recent years. Um, yes, I hope, it, I hope it does indeed uh, lead to other states following suit. Um, but from the point of view of the people who passed it, it's really not mainly about medical marijuana. It's about, it's about putting a thumb in the eye of the federal government and uh, yeah. telling them that we're not going to, we're not going to be bound by federal law. <laughs> so. That's but like uh, in Illinois and on other states as well, when it comes to the public need for lawyers, especially in the cannabis, especially in the regulated cannabis space to provide, you know, counsel and advice to clients is so important that uh, many state bar associations, irrespective of what their Supreme Court may think, put out opinions because they're the ones that are very often in charge or the regulatory commission working in conjunction with uh, the, the Supreme Court of that, per well, not the Supreme Court, but the bar association of that state, put out like the, uh, the professional rules of conduct. And so Illinois, when they legalized it, they've had a comment to one of the particular rules. The exact one is just escapes me right now, but saying that it is it is ethical for a lawyer and it's, it's not just ethical, it's nece necessary. You can't mm -hmm. change this law and then say that you can't access lawyers uh, because think about that. That would just be terrible for um, uh, these businesses that have a lot of cash, a lot of issues and operations and very often complex ownership schemes and restrictions. If they weren't able to access lawyers, that would just be uh, a horrible, horrible <laughs> It would, be awful. it would be awful. But indeed, our state Supreme Court, every state Supreme Court is the ultimate authority on the interpretation of that state's constitution. And it would be, I'm not sure if it's ever happened that a federal court has presumed to overrule a ruling of a state Supreme Court in interpreting that state's constitution. So if our state Supreme Court says black is white and up is down and and so <laughs> so because they're doing this, but they're doing this in conjunction, like they're saying the, the federal government's Second Amendment doesn't go far enough. And so we're going to go further. But then what happens if New Jersey, not New Jersey, if Missouri legalizes it in 2022? And I'd like to mm -hmm. see if there is any uh, possibility of a ballot initiative. Oh, it's likely. So, Absolutely. We're writing it right now. But then will the Supreme Court invalidate it because it violates federal law? And so they'll just be completely two faced. No, I don't think so. They haven't invalidated the medical marijuana provision of our state constitution. They've simply said they're going to threaten lawyers with discipline if they assist anyone. I got to get licensed down there then. You know, because uh, that, uh, oh, we'll, we'll sanction you. All right. Well, I'll be licensed in these other states then. And, mm -hmm. and I'll just make a, a huff, you know, a big huff about uh, you're, de you're denying these, this entire industry the right to a tr an attorney. I mean, imagine mm -hmm. if you were uh, uh, accused of uh, a crime and they'd say, no, I'm sorry, you're not allowed to access counsel. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hmm. yeah, the Sixth Amendment seems to say otherwise, but <laughs> yep. again, it's, uh, it's at least a curious situation. Now, I, I want to point out that as far as, as far as we're aware, no attorney has been disciplined yet for assisting patients or businesses. And most lawyers are just kind of whistling past the graveyard. Most lawyers are just kind of saying, well, let's, let's not talk about that. <laughs> I have talked about it. I may regret talking about it, but um, I think it's fundamentally important because if they can, if they can say the constitution doesn't matter when it comes to medical marijuana, well, they can say the constitution doesn't matter when it comes to anything else. Mm -hmm. So it's a extremely dangerous precedent.
Yep, and it is 20 past the hour. So that means on the East Coast, it's 420 somewhere. Mm -hmm. This 420 is sponsored by WebJoint. We'll talk more with Dan when we get back from it. WebJoint is a software company in the center of allowing cannabis deliveries all over uh, the state of California, and they have been a sponsor of It's 420 Somewhere. If your cannabis company wants to spo sponsor It's 420 Somewhere, get in touch with me at Cannabis Industry Lawyer on Instagram. So, Dan, you mentioned before the break, uh, there's a high likelihood of a ballot initiative in Missouri for 2022. Can you explain to us... Um, the status of it and how it's mm -hmm. being drafted. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's being drafted by a coalition of longtime marijuana law reform activists, primarily normal activists throughout the state of Missouri. Each of our chapters leadership have participated in the drafting process, along with uh, uh, several people from the from the new medical marijuana industry here in Missouri. And we have a we have a, a, a good functional coalition. Not to say there haven't been some disagreements, of course, but they've uh, been reasonable and there have been compromises. And we're going to be filing with the Missouri Secretary of State's office within, and I've been saying this for several weeks, but within a few weeks at most, uh, we're going to be filing with the Missouri Secretary of State's office an adult use initiative, which we intend to place on the ballot in November of 22. And by we, I mean essentially the same group that came together uh, to pass medical marijuana here in November of 2018. Awesome. Do they have any uh, higher hurdles like in Florida that you have to get a super majority or do you just have to pass with a simple majority? It's a simple majority so far, but there's a very active effort in the Missouri General Assembly to change that. There's a very active and ongoing effort uh, to make it much harder to put initiatives on the ballot in our state. However, the proposals to do that uh, will probably not be on the ballot. They have to be passed by a vote of the people, too, of course, and they'll probably not be on the ballot any sooner than November of 22. And we're, of course, part of a coalition resisting making those changes. And then, takes, uh, well, I was going to then ask uh, one more thing, you know, and I know your time is uh, very precious. The um, single issue question of uh, ballot initiatives. Has that been, is that a requirement, Missouri? Has it have previous ones been disqualified for violating it? I can't recall any that have been uh, disqualified on that ground. Uh, it is a requirement. However, it's not as strictly or narrowly defined uh, as it has been in, uh, in some other states. Awesome. Well, Dan, thank you so much for stopping by. Uh, where can people find out more about you and your practice in Missouri? Well, Dan Beats, I've got a website. They can uh, they can go to normal.org and reach the Missouri chapter, reach me through the Missouri chapter at normal's national website, norml.org, and uh, Missouri Normal, likewise, on Facebook. You know, I'm easy to find. Awesome. Thanks so much for stopping by. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend. You too. Yep, WebJoint is uh, in California and they are an operator of software and they're trying to expand into other legal states. And so they are doing a crowdfund. If you wanted to invest in a cannabis delivery software company, this is your chance. It's a Reg CF offering. And if you go to that bit.ly dot um, backslash WJ dash CLN, you can invest. I'm not sure what the minimum investment is. However, they are looking to expand and they're doing a capital raise. Josh, what types of uh, things do you think about how cannabis companies or tech companies like WebJoint can use uh, these types of crowdfunding uh, platforms to raise capital for their ventures. You know, I saw Chris DiGiulio, the CEO of WebJoint pitch for the Marijuana Show season three a couple of years ago now. Um, and they their platform offers a lot of different things. So obviously not just having one niche, but um, they do a lot of different things. So. I have no doubt that they're going to be very creative in the way that they raise capital, including peer to peer or reg a, or, you know, anything other than friends and family and a convertible note, they're going to be pretty creative in the way that they go about it. That's awesome. Friends and family and convertible notes with uh, a little warrants. Maybe you can buy some warrants. I like that credit card advance, credit card advance. <laughs> there we go. 
and they got vis different tiers, different tiers of investment for you. Uh, so yeah, and I just wanted to give them a shout out and also say, of course, they were a sponsor of the program. So we have to make those disclosures as up, Chris? we're the internet, we're the internet, yeah. All right, uh, explosive Memorial Day weekend for Cannabis Ahead, according to the BDSA report. This is coming out of Green Market Reports. Uh, Josh, you've been following the cannabis industry for a great many years. Have you noticed any particular sales data that might substantiate this claim? I have. You know, if you look at um, headset or, um, you know, Frontrunner Data, BDS Analytics, of course, uh, great company. Um, it's interesting, though, like outside of 420, kind of the bigger holidays, you would think, OK, well, maybe 710, um, July 10th. That's 710 is oil spelled backwards if you're not right. a dabber or whatever. Um, so I would think that those other cannabis holidays would would draw in a lot. But what you're actually seeing is Labor Day, Memorial Day, Fourth uh, of July, like barbecue season is huge, um, big big exactly. sales. So yeah, that's what BDSA was uh, saying about that. They were talking about the barbecues. They were talking about the cookouts, the grilling. And so you're going to go there, and you might not want to get over served with uh, something that may make it more, you know. Uh, difficult to, to get back home. And so you might want to break out the joints because then, you know, after about an hour or so in, in a Gatorade, you'll be, you'll be good. You know, I think a lot of it is discretionary too, though. You'll find a lot of edibles because um, people want They have to deal, they have anxiety. So whether it's family or friends, like even coming to this barbecue today, my, my wife had anxiety because we haven't seen humans in like a, almost a year and a half, you mm -hmm. know, so she, I'm sure she's over it now, but you know, when you're dealing with family, maybe that anxiety doesn't just evaporate the moment you see them and you need an edible for that whole duration. <laughs> right. Right. Because that's the animals. thing about families. They just do terrible things to one another sometimes. Yeah. Uh, it's weird. But all right. Colorado, it's to make up to 25 percent of sales on Thursday and Sunday for their Memorial Day sales. It's uh, quite a lot. Quite a lot. According to the can yeah, Colorado to make up 25 percent of their cannabis sales on Thursday and, and Saturday. Oh, wait. I'm not sure if I'm understanding this. Maybe it's Thursday and Saturday, or is it Thursday and Sunday? Because like right Thursday, there, it says Thursday, so Sunday, like and then underneath it says Thursday, Saturday. So in Washington, for example, you'll sell one third of all of your edibles for the week on Fridays between the hours of a three and five. So just a couple of hour window is when you're going to sell a third of all edibles. So people get off work on Friday, boom, they're heading to it. So I think what that article is saying is that um, before and after – uh, Memorial Day is when you have huge sales. So quarter of all of the sales are going to happen right before Labor Day uh, or Memorial Day, excuse me, and then right after. Maybe well, I mean, it's easier for you to control and stock up on the supply of oils and edibles, I would imagine. Uh, I wonder if flower prices fluctuate then uh, into these large weekends, because those those schedules to pull down those plants, those take you know time. You can't just I mean, you have to amp them up months in advance. Yeah, me and Miggy just did a, a, a cannabis product review and I was asking for CBG and somebody was like, well, I have CBN. It's actually from light degradation and it's orange and it's been in the in the window right. forever. And I was like, you're not selling me on this. <laughs> like, no, thank you. Yeah, there's no terpenes left. It just yeah. it just makes you angry. <laughs> <laughs> little edgy, like green crack for me. Yeah, yeah. Well, that is really, really interesting that... Uh, they have all that. So, you know, with that, we're about halfway through the show. We could play Name That Strain. You want to play Name That Strain? This is the Name first time for you, right? Strain. All right, let's do that. This is a classic strain. And uh, and it's, it's one of those strains that, you know, uh, people would guess it very, very quickly if you say the wrong thing about it, you know, but then I think a lot of strains are like that. Um, and then this was on the time of name that strain where we described to the people listening at home or in their cars, probably uh, uh, what the strain looks like. Uh, I would say it's got very dense trichomes uh, production. And then it also has a fairly uh, minty green, not too dark, uh, not too uh, light and completely covered with red hairs. What about uh, Josh? What are what's your opinions on that nug? Well, it smells delicious. First of all, uh, I would say it's kind of a classic Christmas tree. Uh, the orange hairs are super, super classic. I'm guessing it's high in pinene. 
um, a sativa dominant kind of denser flower, um, something of, of a blue dream circa 2008. Yeah, uh, just as one hint, and I've seen a lot of OGs in the guessing room, and OG may be associated with this strain, but it is very often not gone with the OG. They have a, a different name that you would just drop off the OG, and it's, to me, at least more likely to be known by that. So uh, while you guys are getting your guesses in on that one, I did want to tell you that we are going on tour, and uh, we're going to have, I got, I got uh, junk so there will be t-shirts and then there'll be brochures for our services and then we also have the swag bags because as you go to these trade shows you get a lot of swag you need a bag uh, and if you go to cannabisimp.com you will be able to use the promo code clb15 for 15 percent off your ticket uh, next show is in three weeks in chicago Three weeks in Chicago, June 24th and 25th. Come on out and see us. It's a Friday, Thursday. I may have to do some content. I might not be able to do it live, depending on how good the, the internet is there. But uh, if I have to record it, whatever. I'll chop it up and then do something after it. Is Cannabis Industrial Marketplace is what Cannabis IMP stands for. And this is their emerging market uh, tour. So we'll be in Chicago, June 24th, 25th. And then we go to Michigan on July 13th and 14th. When do I get to see you in Seattle, man? I didn't see Washington State on there. Uh, you see, that's the thing. We are promoting Cannabis IMP right now. Oh, wow. Chances are I will not be present in Michigan or I will actually be present in Michigan, but I will be at somebody else's tent. Uh, and then I'll just be saying hi. Uh, and then, of course, uh, I have to go to Seattle on july 15th through july 20th so josh and i need some ideas for our content that we can film out there i do want to check out a dispensary if any dispensaries will allow us to do like a piece on that you know cash handling or some type of uh, aspect of their their compliance requirements you know that's the exciting stuff that you get on cannabis legalization news smash those likes and hit subscribe for compliance requirements yep yeah yeah, all right. Let's see what else is in the news. Uh, let's see. All right. Well, we're going to give out a shout to our um, our members. Our members are uh, three different levels. We have general members for two bucks a month, uh, and then if you're a member for twenty four, well, not twenty four, twelve months. When you get your twelve month sticker, we send you a shirt, or you can just get a shirt immediately by becoming a legalizer in chief. That's twenty five dollars a month. Uh, Miggy and I make uh, custom stuff for the members. Miggy has his own level. It's five bucks a month. And so he makes you guys content. Uh, it's pretty fun. Have you gotten uh, the ability to unlike, unlock that at the Talking Heads yet? No, not yet. Yeah. I have applied, but um, I don't meet the requirements. I can't monetize. I can't do any of that. But um, yeah, we I can't think, monetize um, much. Yeah. Maybe if you offer me a custom bobblehead for $420, I might just become a member. Nice. Is that like the, the Platinum Chronic Club membership? I guess. We could make a more expensive membership. We could make yeah. the ridiculous. Remember, Google gets 30% of this membership. Where you're like, <laughs> I don't know. Jesus. Yeah, but uh, it is it's fun. And then so uh, I do a lot of webinars. I do a webinar a month about some type of cannabis business issue that's applicable. Oh, do we have somebody who has guessed the name that strain? Let's see here. Uh, no, no, no. No winners no. yet. No. Okay. Superheroes. There we go. All right. <laughs> somebody, somebody will get it now before we go and do uh, uh, something about Flint's old police Academy going to be used to grow weed despite objections. Uh, has anybody with the hint of superhero get their guess in for name that string. Teddy spaghetti is close. He needs to clock it back. And there it is. Sweet tooth gets it. Bruce Banner, Sweet Tooth, uh, thank you so much for playing Name That Strain. Really appreciate it. If you want a shirt, please do go follow me at Cannabis Industry Lawyer on Instagram and DM me, and then we will mail you a shirt. So Flint's old police academy has been sold to grow weed despite objections. What do you think about that, Josh? I think it's beautiful. I think it's full circle. You know, why not clean it up with a little bit of cannabis? That building looks like it's seen better days anyways. Oh, yeah. You want to get the price quote on that? You see what they paid for that? That's ridiculous. 500 grand in Flint, Michigan. Like, 
Well, it's called the green zone effect. Michigan is kind of like California in the sense that there's only so many spots in the state that you can grow weed. And therefore, it commands a premium. And you'll see that a lot on uh, when you're going real estate shopping for your grow or your uh, dispo in Michigan. And you'll see these busted out pieces of shit for like $500,000, $600,000. You're like, what? Oh, it's green zone. Oh, fuck. That show Good Bones is a house flipping show, kind of, and they buy houses between one and four thousand dollars in Illinois. So mm -hmm. I know that you can find cheaper houses than that in in Flint, Michigan. But yeah, they're gouging people for sure, unless there's like a thousand acres that comes with that. <laughs> Let me see here if there's a thousand four point four acre parcel. Uh, it should be four point two acres. Come on, let's round oh, that down. Come on. There we go. A divided Flint City Council approved the sale of 3420 South St. John Street in a five to four vote on Monday, May the 25th, despite protests that the property, which is zoned to allow grow operation, see it's been green zoned, wasn't properly advertised for sale. They're like, no, you can't sell this. You didn't, you didn't advertise it appropriately. <laughs> Yep. And there's an open, it was a fair and open bidding process and a half a dollar, half a million dollars is a lot for our city's general fund. It's all about the dinero. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. That's a ton of dough. They're going to have to retrofit that building and everything else, but they're going to bust that building down. Well, I guess, I don't know. We'd have to have an engineer go through and the engineer might say, just, just tear it down. They got to leave that jail cell up and grow in there at least one harvest. Oh, do you think like um, how the plant is cared for by the person growing it and like where it's grown impacts the high that it gives you and its terpene profile? So if you grew yeah. the weed in the holding cell, wouldn't that be like some of the most angry weed that people would smoke and go like nuts yeah. or something? I yeah, don't know. I think there's be some good. crazy energy in there. Yeah, that would be interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but then again, that's bullshit, right? That has to be. You know, I don't understand energy and ghosts and spirits. Come on. I, I think Mythbusters got it down with uh, really angry music uh, grew the fastest. Now they've got vibration tables to give the, the plants the equivalent of energy. I think we are I've all energy and, and you're releasing either good vibes or bad vibes. So vibration I tables are a thing now. Yeah, yeah. I, one of my uh, buddies, Dan, had like these vibration tables or these vibration pots that would, you know, kind of uh, adapt to a table. So then you would use that and whatever, for whatever sonic reason, these vibration things magically create growth in your plants, mm -hmm. or at least their salesmen claim that. <laughs> and so uh, that is one of those things where you're like, is that real? Well, there's one way to find out. That'll be $155,000, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting nonetheless, though. I mean, I wouldn't mind trying it. I think there's some validity to that. You know, when that science, that Japanese scientist who wrote negative words on ice and they sure. came out all crazy looking and he wrote positive words on ice and they came out pretty. Crazy. You, you haven't seen that? No. You got to no, look at that, man. There's a really old um, study about a Japanese guy who wrote positive and negative words on ice and it, it comes up exactly like you would think, like beautiful crystals with nice words and, and really like nasty lines and stuff for the negative words hmm. with ice. And so without even saying anything just writing it down so i would imagine if if there is some validity to that and actually saying it and, and having that energetic uh component to it would would enhance the plant yeah well get hippie on it man come on gotta get hippie on it i'm wearing a dead shirt after all but like <laughs> we also have to break down the data and be real i mean like michigan's an open state and they're still having a hard time opening uh, doors for black and brown entrepreneurs and they're substantially underrepresented. I mean, of course, we just talked about buying a piece of crap for $500,000. And so as soon as you're green zone, like the, as soon as you come into contact with this plant, somebody wants to sell you like vibration energy crystals so you, you can grow more of it. And then like the, the dilapidated house was $500,000 so you can grow it. Uh, and then of course, like anybody can get a license purportedly. But they say that only about 3.8% of existing licensed recreational cannabis businesses have black ownership stake and 1.5% have a Hispanic ownership stake. However, black and Hispanic communities in Michigan make up 19% and 5.3% of Michigan's popula population, respectively. So uh, the doors are still kind of closed uh, or some reason why they're not getting involved. We should commission a study. Yeah, yeah, and they're not unique in in that region. Washington State, for example, you know, we have um, less than one percent 
that are producer processors that are black cannabis farmers and the Anyone could have gotten in at that level. The producer processors was just a matter of like a $500 license. But through the consolidation process, a lot of those guys went out. They didn't have the capital to back them because they had, um, you know, issues one way or another, whatever it was. So, you know, I think that as these social equity programs roll out, they're going to have to be a little bit more efficient and do a little bit more work to kind of ensure that they don't fall to the wayside, that black farmers just become uh, you know, a, a novelty or um, in the history books. On the other side, on the retail for Washington State, that was a lottery and completely unfair. And they should you know, change that. Black farmers should challenge it and get more black owners in retail. So hopefully you know, Michigan and other uh, emerging markets will change that, learn from their mistakes that we've had on the West Coast and, and yeah. rectify it. Because like a retail operation, I would assume, like, I mean, nothing fancy, but you could open a retail operation for you know hundreds of thousands of dollars in uh, the West Coast, I would hope. I mean, like if you're not going to purchase the real estate and you're going to be a tenant and you're not going to have like a ridiculous operation, they should be able to access the license and capital to be able to open their doors. I mean, stuff gets really crazy expensive when you start buying like premium indoor flowering facilities and extraction labs and packaging requirements and the manufacturing, you know. It's what I can when get. you came out right. here uh, for Hemp Fest a couple years ago, did Miggy take you to uh, the very first dispensary that opened up, um, Seattle City, or I can't even remember the name of it, but that no, was yeah. probably opened up with fifteen thousand dollars, five thousand for the Not monthly the, rent, yeah. and then maybe five grand for some uh, glass cabinets. It's one of the most uh, inexpensive shops I've seen to this. So day, we would need like no reg though. I mean, like because like there's no compliance, and so like the the reason why it costs that much has nothing to do with, I mean, like you see, I mean, like now with lumber being where it's at, fine, <laughs> let's double the price. Still 30 grand to open a dispensary is freaking nothing. It's like a fraction of what it, the, they usually cost now because of the regulatory compliance you have. It's not a planet 13 by any stretch, right? right. You're just literally walking into kind of um, a, a rundown, not rundown, but a minimal um, handy mark, just hole in the wall with glass display cabinet, very minimal, very, very minimal. So yeah, you don't need a ton of dough. I think what we saw from Medman was a mistake when they, you know, weren't really um, responsible with, with the capital that they raised. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, like that's, that's just how it is, but then uh, good news out of Minnesota. So medical marijuana users will soon be allowed to smoke cannabis in Minnesota. The Minnesota legislature has approved changes to the state's program and Governor Tim Waltz signed the Omnibus Health and Human Service Bill into law in the last week of May of 2021, which includes provisions to expand the state's medical cannabis program back from 2014 with qualified patients allowed to buy the drug starting in July 2015. Well, congratulations. You're allowing the number one product sold in every single state flower. But where are they going to smoke it at? Do they have any lounges? Uh, no, they do not yet have lounges. And uh, they may have lounges in a bill that has not yet passed. It hybrid passed. And so the House approved a bill that would have legalized recreational marijuana for adults in May 13th. But it did not get a single hearing in the Senate where Republicans opposed it. So, you know, a couple of steps forward, a couple steps back. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm glad that they're going to at least be able to start getting flour uh, for smokable patients. What I don't know about Minnesota's is if they needed to uh, control THC levels. I know sometimes they have to control THC levels, especially like in Georgia, for example. They want a 5% THC. And I think Texas, Texas just had a good piece of news about Delta 8. So, you know, if you like the Delta 8 product, you know, smash them likes hit subscribe and then share this with somebody who's hustling that Delta eight. But uh, in Texas, that was something they were trying to ban. And then that got filched right at the end. And then of course, uh, this is about the time that legislatures throughout the, the United States, they're kind of like SNL. When SNL goes on break, all the legislatures go home. And, um, and that's where we're at, you know, we're at the end of May and, and Illinois is a prime example. They just passed HB 1443, you know, right on time, just like you knew they would. Beautiful. Yep. It's not bad. And then what else is going on in, in this one? Okay. So the updates to the state's medical cannabis law could go into effect before March 1 of 2022 uh, if they can start testing the dried cannabis. So they just need some testing labs. 
They can get testing labs. That's easy. Uh, then what happens when Minnesota will no longer be the only state with a medical marijuana program that bans smoking the drug? Okay. Uh, as of May, uh, 36 states allow medical cannabis, while 17 states in the District of Columbia allow recreational, and the National Conference of State Legislatures are providing those numbers. Only 34,450 uh, patients, and there's only 15 qualifying conditions. So that is a very strict and controlled market, you know? Yeah, medical numbers are always really, really low. A lot of people are just don't sign up for them, and I don't know how well they're tracked, but I've never really seen outstanding medical numbers. And they always go away. The medical programs always get uh, demolished as soon as REC comes out. So they're kind of a short-lived program anyways. So that one type of hole-in-the-wall dispensary that you were just mentioning that you could open for like, you know, 15, 20 grand, uh, that was a medical dispensary. It, well, they converted it to a REC, so it's still around. And they haven't done. They haven't put a single dollar into it in like five years. Oh wow! So they have a compliant rec facility that has like no security. Well, they have a guy checking ID in the front. We'll definitely take you there, and I'll show it to you. Wow. They've got they've in, they've improved the facade by making it flashy. But you go into the store, and and you'll be surprised by how small it is and how minimal it is. Well, yeah, that's the thing because like when Illinois, you're trying to design something, and it's like no. If you read the regulations, you have to have these at every door. You need access control so that employees, when they leave, like you take their badge and they can no longer access the premises. I mean, the compliance cost drives the uh, barrier to entry. Definitely. But I think it's really minimal in Washington state with just the requirements on seed to sale for the farmers, for the rec shops. That's minimal, too. You have to check IDs and have uh, cameras. And that's about it. Hmm. I mean, there's some more stuff in there, but it's nothing uh, too substantial. Yeah, it's pretty easy. Awesome. Well, news out of Pennsylvania. Uh, an eye doctor who grew marijuana for his dying wife has been pardoned. Thank goodness. So Governor Tom Wolf on Wednesday pardoned an eye doctor who began growing marijuana to help his dying wife reduce her use of opioids. It was Dr. Paul Ezel of Delaware County outside Philadelphia, and he has served six months in jail in 2014 and lost his ability to practice medicine after pleading guilty to a felony drug charge. Damn. That sucks. So he lost his license to practice medical law and, and half a decade of revenue. That's, right. that's terrible. Yes. Yes, it is. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why homegrown and safe access is such an important thing. And then there's different strains and cultivars that have been made specifically for uh, this type of uh, trauma, uh, you know. And so, like, it's... Is it Bruce Banner, by chance? Bruce Banner was not necessarily bred for opioids, I thought, but um, for, like, for end of days. But, like, stuff, like, you know, to help you with anxiety and, and also with pain. So I'm thinking, like, maybe more high CBD cultivars, maybe with some THC in them. But those ones, the more medicinally activated ones, you know. Yeah, maybe like yeah. a Jack Hare. Jack Hare, you know, or an ACDC or a lifter. Yeah, man, crazy. Next month, the pardon board will hear the case of Ezel's daughter, Victoria Ezel, a nurse who pleaded guilty and served probation and lost her license because of a marijuana case or the same marijuana case. It's just, um, I tell you, that's just ridiculous. And now uh, I'm glad that he's been pardoned, but will he be reinstated so he can get his practice back? And then uh, will he be able to apply for a cannabis license and maybe have uh, the ability to have a dispensary? The dispensaries in Pennsylvania are very vertically integrated. That's one of the fun things we might want to do uh, is sometimes I like to say, well, what's the price of an eighth in? And then you name the city and in the, in the, we should get a bumper for that. Uh, checking prices on the street in uh, in the in the USA or who knows, you know, because like I don't know where we could find Canadian prices and I don't know if people would want would care. Yeah, a lot of people care. You can get data from headset and everywhere else. But Pennsylvania is an interesting market because I don't think of it as being um, too populated, but it, it actually is. And I've gotten more calls out of Pennsylvania for pre-roll and, and automated joint rolling machine than anywhere else in, in North America. So I don't know what it is about a lot of calls and for Pennsylvania for like, you know, Hey, how do I get my cannabis license? I'm like, you call your legislature and you tell them to legalize weed. Yeah. yeah. A lot yeah. of interest in there though, for sure. Lots. 
We're going to go to a Columbia Care website and see if I can get prices on the Columbia Care website. I am 21 and older. I am. Oh, they got a C menu. Okay, let's uh, let's go to Scranton, Pennsylvania news. Uh, anybody watching from Pennsylvania, don't forget to tell us in the comments and, you know, also hit them like buttons. So we got some Sticky Blossom Hybrid Live Sauce. That is a $60 gram. Let's see. Do we have anything that's not? Oh, there's some flour. We have a hybrid Blue Dream crossed with PCK. That is a $100, uh, seven grams. So that would be a quarter. $100 for a quarter, 16.5. But then they have a nice, at least they have to list all the terpenes in that profile. Let's go for an eighth. Do we even have an eighth anywhere? Or a gram, $70. Oh, there's, there's an eighth right there. Orange cookies. Uh, from G Leaf Medicinal can or Medical Cannabis, 23%, and it is 55 bucks. Oh, wait. And then for, okay, 55 for an eighth and 100 for a quarter. And so that is the price, Scranton, Pennsylvania. Yeah, that's not cheap. Nope. That is yeah, not $60 a gram for concentrate isn't, isn't too bad for, you know, an emerging market, but that's going to come down like more than half. Although I just did see a, a gram of concentrate for cookies in Washington State for 60 bucks. So maybe it's about the brand. I don't know. I think it's about the brand, and I think it's about controlling the supply. Yeah. Uh, however, you know, you know, Joss is joining us, Capital Markets Analyst. And so we're going to do some stock news to wrap up the show. Oh, boy. In stock news, a medical cannabis firm backed by Snoop Dogg begins trading in London, according to CNBC. Oxford Cannabinoid Technologies, which enjoys backing from rapper Snoop Dogg and tobacco giant Imperial Brands, launched Friday on the London Stock Exchange. So, interesting the they're using London now. I, I'm not sure why they're using London. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, you know, the FTSE um, is an interesting index. Um, it's an interesting market to be in, but maybe they're trying to um, become an acquisition target for Jazz Pharmaceuticals or the like. Um, Perhaps. No cost it, of does, Verde Capital. Yeah, it does say that the, this, this company specializes in pain alleviating cannabinoid drug development yeah. uh, and gross proceeds of 16.5 million pounds, which of course, for those of you who can't do that math in their head, is about $23.4 million. Uh, and then their IPO is a valuation of 48 pounds or about 70 million. And the share prices are at five pence. They're quoting uh, the ticker in, um, or the, the price in, in stocks in, on the FTSE is in pence and pounds, I guess. Mm -hmm. Crazy. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense to have an exit strategy. If Jazz Pharmaceutical bought GW Pharma, then you might want to list on there because the Canadian uh, companies, they want to get into the U.S. So why not list over in the U.K. if that's your specialty and uh, make that your exit strategy? Uh, I'm not sure what it is, but you know, he's got a lot of talent in it. So Snoop Dogg has invested in multiple cannabis companies uh, from his venture capital firm. Of course, Snoop Dogg has one, Casa Verde. Uh, his firm has also banned plant-based food companies such as Outstanding Food and tech names like Klarna, Robinhood, and Reddit. So Snoop Dogg is a venture capitalist. Yeah, I don't think he's really done anything with with cannabis though like if you look at ease the delivery service 35 million dollars and you can't deliver anything like man you're doing something wrong so and then I think a lot they of get, these guys I thought they got arrested i thought ease was busted uh probably i don't i didn't huh i don't know <laughs> well you know uh, that's what it looks like they're trying trying to do and um stock news in uh, and the footsie so anyway, man, I wanted to thank you for joining us and tell the people where they can find uh, uh, more about the Talking Hedge and the rest of Josh Kincaid. The Talking Hedge Podcast dot com or all of your favorite podcast uh, video or audio podcast uh, sites. The Talking Hedge. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us, Josh. Uh, have a thank good uh, cookout. I know we're in the middle of your cookout, so thanks for stopping in. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Make sure you like and subscribe to keep up with all cannabis legalization news. We will see you on Wednesday. Wednesday. Wednesday.